Welcome to the church family that is lifting lives through living love, inspiring hope, filling with faith, and transforming our world. These recorded messages are made available so that you might have additional opportunities to stay connected with us, and then you might learn and grow in your faith. God bless you as you hear the word today. And now, the message. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, Jesus replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus said. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Now which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the house to the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask that you pour out the blessing of your spirit on the hearing and the proclamation of your word today. May your spirit speak to each of our hearts. Convict us, shape us, renew us in love that we might be your people. In Christ's name we pray, amen. A few months ago, there was a new sitcom that came out on CBS called Living Biblically. I don't know if any of you saw the debut. It only lasted a few episodes before I think they canceled it, but it was based on a book called The Year of Living Biblically by A.J. Jacobs. I happened to read the book a number of years ago. A.J. Jacobs is a journalist, but he has a unique method for doing his research. He's one of those guys that just dives straight in and has to experience everything. So one year, he decided he wanted to kind of explore fitness. For a year, he did every possible fitness craze, bought every possible machine, did every single diet just to see how fit he could get. That's kind of what he does, and then he writes about the experience. And this particular time, when he wrote this book, he he wasn't a very religious man at all, but things happened in his life that made him start thinking about second-guessing his stance towards religion, and he decided, well, I want to kind of re-explore my faith. But to do that, the only way he knew to do it was to dive in headfirst, and so he set for himself the goal that for one year he was going to obey every single commandment in the Bible to the best of his ability. He didn't quite know what he was doing when he started. Uh, Because we've already seen, you know, we've talked about the Ten Commandments a few weeks ago, and we've already seen how hard and how impossible it is just to live out Ten Commandments. But that's just the tip of the iceberg, because what follows the Ten Commandments in the next few books of the Bible are 603 individual laws. Whenever I hear that number 603, it always makes me think of those total commercials, you know, like, like how many laws do you need to follow to get all the nutrients that are in one bowl of love God and love your neighbor? 613. You know, like it's, it's an impossible number of laws that they had to follow back in those days. And so A.J. Jacobs dove in and he realized, man, he had his work cut out for him. 
For starters, he said I had to start paying attention to, to the clothes I wore. Half the clothes in my closet I couldn't wear anymore because they were of mixed fiber, and that was something that was forbidden in the Old Testament. He had to pay attention to what he ate. There's all kinds of kosher laws about which animals, what kinds of meat are clean and unclean, and, and even clean meat you can't eat if it's been, you know, cooked along with dairy. So that kind of wiped out pizza, and not to mention pork and bacon and ribs and all those good things off his diet instantly. He said the worst thing was though figuring out, you know, he had to pay attention to where he sat because you never knew when you were sitting in a place where someone before might have been unclean. That word clean shows up a lot in the, among those 613 laws. In fact, in the book of Leviticus, just the book of Leviticus, the word clean or unclean appears over 130 times. So there's all kinds of things that are unclean. And, and so AJ found that he, he, he couldn't sit in any kind of public place. He couldn't sit on the subway. He couldn't go to a, a Colts game or a sporting event and sit down because you never knew if someone unclean had been sitting there before him. He, he said, you know, I couldn't even sit in my house sometimes because once a month my wife would be considered unclean according to Scripture. And his wife did not like being considered unclean. And so she would intentionally sit in every seat in the house so that he could not sit down. He, he said he got to where he just carried around a little camping stool so he could rest his legs every once in a while, you know, even in his own home. If it sounds a little bit like cooties, that's exactly what it makes me think of, too. If you, I, I don't know if you like this meme, you know, you get cooties, you get cooties, everyone gets cooties, everything is unclean. Or to put it, you know, more modern terms uh, for those kids and families out there, it's like the, the, the stinky cheese touch and the diary of a wimpy kid. Like, that you can make someone unclean just by touching them. So why does the Bible have this deep concern, especially the Old Testament, why this deep concern for, for cleanliness? Well, the, the cleanliness laws were in some ways at the time a way of protecting the people. They, they were protecting the people from things that in that day and that time spread disease. There were ways of protecting the people from, from idols and things that would corrupt the worship of God. So, so cleanliness, maintaining your cleanliness was a way of honoring and pleasing God. And it shows up all through Scripture, not just in those first five books of the Bible, favorite passages that we like, like, like Psalm 51, you know, the, this great psalm of confession. How does David pray? He says, create in me a clean heart. I want to be clean again. When Isaiah sees uh, God in this vision and receives his call, the first words out of his mouth is, woe unto me, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. In fact, Isaiah's vision of God's holiness is so complete that he says, the best of our righteousness is like dirty rags compared to God's holiness. That's how clean he is and how dirty we are in response. And if you say, well, that's just kind of old-fashioned, like people don't think that way anymore. How many of us know the phrase, cleanliness is next to godliness? Do you know who coined that phrase? It was John Wesley. He's the first person recorded in history to, as quoting that, that phrase, cleanliness is next to godliness. I, as, as someone who is not a neat freak, I've never loved that passage. I like this coffee mug instead that says, uh, cleanliness is next to impossible. So, uh, you know, I think that's more accurate and true. At its best, this concern for cleanliness it was a sign of piety. It was a measure of one's devotion, the, you know, how committed you were to God. But at its worst, this concern for cleanliness, it, it, it bred a religion that was full of self-righteousness, that was full of judgment, devoid of compassion, especially to anyone who might have been unclean, because you just had to keep your distance from them, lest you make yourself unclean too. You know, so A.J. Jacobs couldn't sit where his wife sat, you know, once a month. Well, think about the woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years that once touched Jesus' robe. For 12 years, she was unclean. She couldn't touch other people. Think about lepers. Because once someone was diagnosed with leprosy, 
You were cast out of the town. You had to move away from your family lest you make them unclean, lest you make their house unclean. You had to live in a colony on the outskirts of town. And whenever you entered into the town, you had to ring a bell or you had to cry out so everyone could keep a 50-foot distance between you and them. You were completely isolated if you were unclean. And it wasn't just physical conditions that made you unclean. It was spiritual ones. There's a whole class of people that, that, that in the New Testament, they just call them sinners. And we're all sinners. We're all sinners. But, but, but this particular class of people they called sinners, it was, it was people who made their living by doing something that was shady and unseemly. Tax collectors, prostitutes, anyone in that class, they were sinners and unclean. Foreigners, Gentiles were by definition unclean because of the, the gods they worshipped and the food they ate. Samaritans were unclean too. Now, Samaritans are an interesting case, though, because Samaritans weren't Gentiles. They weren't foreigners. If you look at a map of Samaria, you can see it is right smack dab in the middle of Israel. To the north is Galilee, where Jesus was raised, Nazareth, that whole area. To the south is Jerusalem. Samaria was right in the middle. So, so where did Samaritans come from? What made them unclean? We well, have to go back a thousand years before Jesus lived. And about that time, there was a split in the kingdom of Israel between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. It was David's grandson, Rehoboam. He managed the kingdom badly, and the two kingdoms split. And, and, and in the north, their capital was Samaria. South, their capital was Jerusalem. And in 722 B.C., the Assyrians came along and destroyed the northern, the, the northern kingdom, but left the southern kingdom alone. And then about a century and a half later, the Babylonians came along, destroyed Jerusalem and the southern kingdom, and marched the Israelites off into captivity. The, the Jews that the Assyrians had left stayed where they were. And they, as a matter of survival, they intermarried with other tribes, you know, there's the people living around them. And, and, and as such... In the Israelites' eyes, they became impure. And so when the Israelites returned from captivity and reestablished the city of Jerusalem, they looked with suspicion on all those Samaritans who had intermarried. They, they, they kind of kept their distance. They were second-class citizens. You didn't touch them. You didn't enter their territory, or you became unclean. In fact, in that day and time, if you lived, like, say, in Nazareth and Galilee, you didn't travel straight south to Jerusalem because you'd have to go through Samaritan country to do that. Instead, you go all the way over to the River Jordan, go down the River Jordan to Jericho, and then take the road from Jericho to Jerusalem. All that to keep yourself clean. So what did Jesus think about all these rules about cleanliness and uncleanliness? Well, anytime he got the chance, he broke the rules. He criticized the rules. He, 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 he went against them every time. He, for starters, he traveled in Samaria multiple times, talked to the Samaritans, entered their homes without any concern of, of becoming unclean himself. Same thing with the tax collectors and the prostitutes, the sinners. He hung out with them. He went to their parties. He had fellowship, table fellowship. He, he shared food with them. Didn't concern about cleanliness at all. When the woman touched him in the market, he stopped and said, who touched me? Not to call her out and shame her for being unclean, but rather to restore her as a daughter of Israel to say, your faith has made you well. And when the lepers said, Jesus, son of God, save me. He didn't just kind of keep his distance and wave the hand and they were healed. No, he went to them and touched them. It's like that old joke, that old philosophical question about if you find a, a hair on a soap, does it make the soap dirty or does it make the hair clean? Noodle on that. You can kind of think about that later, you know. But, <laughs> but that's the question. Is like, because it seems like when people touch Jesus, they didn't make Jesus unclean at all. No, he made them clean. And he attacked the, the cleanliness laws in his teaching. You know, at one point, someone asked him, what, what, what can we eat? What can we not eat? He says, it's not what goes in your mouth that makes you unclean or impure. That doesn't defile you. It's what comes out because what comes out reflects what's in your heart. 
The Pharisees he criticized. He says, woe to you Pharisees and scribes because you're like coffee mugs. You're like cups that all you've washed is the outside, but you left the inside all unclean, all full of greed and self-indulgence. Kind of, you know, we got a little picture of a mug just so you can kind of picture what it would like. Go to the, just to drink out of that, you know? Like, it's gross. But that's what he was saying their faith is like, is, is you're all clean on the outside, but you've forgotten the most important part, the heart. When he was asked which commandment, which rule is the most important to follow, he didn't even really point to a rule. He just went straight to the heart of the commandments. He said, love God, love your neighbor. Everything else hangs on those things, love. And so the teachers, the religious experts of that day, they felt themselves challenged by this. They built a whole life upon maintaining their ritual cleanliness. It was how they understood who God was and, and how they understood who they were in relationship, not only to God, but to everyone else. They were the ones who kept themselves clean, and they didn't like what Jesus did, that he disregarded all their categories. They didn't like how he taught, so they challenged him whenever they got the chance. And so we see today a lawyer approaches. And this lawyer knows the right answers. He's studied, you know, in Sunday school. He knows when Jesus says, you know, he asked the rhetorical question, what do I have to do to get eternal life? Jesus says, what do you think? He knows the right answer. He says, well, love God and love people, right? Love your neighbor. Jesus says, yeah, do that and you'll live. But like any good lawyer... He wants to define the terms, right? He wants to, let, let's be precise in our language here, Jesus. Who exactly is my neighbor? I love how scripture puts it. He asked that question because he wants to justify himself. If you ever find yourself needing to justify something, that's because it's crooked. And so Jesus responds by telling a story. It's a story that is beloved, well-known, one of the you know, top stories that Jesus ever told in terms of its uh, popularity. He, the story is about a man who goes from Jerusalem to Jericho. And, and, and we know this road is one of the most dangerous roads back in those days. Well-traveled, but you can see it kind of goes through the mountains, all kinds of switchbacks. And, 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 and robbers could hide behind those switchbacks so that the unsuspecting traveler would never know they were there. And so robbers set upon this man, beat him, rob him, leave him for dead. But there's good news because coming up that road is a priest and a Levite. Like, you know, these are the usual suspects. Like, if you're going to expect anyone to help this guy out, it should be the priest. It should be the Levite. They, their lives were dedicated to God, and yet they don't. They just pass on by. In fact, it says they move over to the other side of the road to maintain even more distance between them and the fallen man. Why is that? The Bible doesn't really tell us exactly, so we have to conjecture. I mean, sometimes we guess, well, maybe they were in a hurry, like they had some place to go. Because it's true for all of us, we experience that when we're in a hurry, we're less aware of the needs of others, right? So maybe they're in a hurry, or maybe it was they were afraid. Think about the last time you saw a hitchhiker on the side of the road, and maybe you had an impulse to help, but then you thought, I don't know. I, I don't want to be like on the news like, you know, at night. Of, so I'm just going to keep on driving by. Maybe it was fear. Scholars suggest the reason that, we, that they think the, the priest and the Levite passed them by was cleanliness. You see, back in Numbers 19, one of those clean and unclean laws, we read, whoever touches a human corpse will be unclean for seven days. They have to purify themselves ritually for seven days. And if they fail to purify themselves after touching a human corpse, they defile the Lord's tabernacle. They must be cut off from Israel. So these priests and Levites, maybe they're on their way to some religious duty, some religious service. And if they touch this guy, then they instantly defile and disqualify themselves. And so their concern for their own cleanliness trumps their compassion. Hold on to that. Their cleanliness wins out against compassion. Then comes along the Samaritan. Samaritan. 
And we know that this is the hero of the story. I mean, it's the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? But we forget in this day and age the shock and scandal that it was that that man is the hero because he was unclean. He was a second-class citizen. I mean, you have to think for a moment of whatever category you think of today when I say the word unclean. Who comes to your mind? Do you think of an immigrant? Do you think of someone who's homeless? Do you think of someone who's a sex offender on the registry? Do you think of, of someone who has an addiction? Whatever that person is, that's who Jesus was saying is the hero of the story. That was the shock. That was the scandal. They weren't the victim. They weren't the one in need of being helped. No, they were the ones who came to the rescue. And it's precisely because they're unclean that they don't look at the hurting man through that filter. They don't ask themselves, is he clean or unclean? Can I defile myself if I touch him? They're already technically unclean. They just, they just see someone in need and they go to their aid. And Jesus says, you know, he set up the story, that's what it means to be neighbor. He asked the lawyer when the story's done, who was a neighbor to the broken man? And you can see the lawyer, he can't even say the Samaritan. He just says the one who had mercy. And Jesus says, go, do likewise. You see, in that day and age, there were all kinds of boundaries that separated people. And last week I talked about boundaries, how God gives us boundaries to keep us safe. And that's true when it comes to sin and behavior. But when it comes to people, God tears down those boundaries every day because we're all neighbor, near, far, neighbor. People who look like us, people who don't. People who think like us, people who don't. People who talk like us, speak the same language, and people who don't. People who vote like us, and people who don't. People who believe like us, and people who don't. We're all humanity together. We're all God's creatures in creation. And especially whenever you see someone in need, you have the opportunity to be neighbor to that person. When I was a kid, uh, a, a teenager, one of my favorite speakers was a guy named Keith Naylor. We, he was, spoke every year at a conference that we go to shortly after Christmas. And, and Keith was different from most of the youth speakers I'd hear. He wasn't necessarily, you know, crazy and, and, and charismatic and silly and fun. Like, he, he was, he, he was kind of low-key in a way, but he was real and he was honest. And, and he spoke with a, I mean, just amazing transparency about his own struggles with uh, sex addiction and with shame. He talked about how God saved him at a time when he was just trapped in a pattern of self-destruction. And, and listening to his story, it was probably the first time I, I can ever remember really believing that God loved me the way I was, that I didn't have to improve myself to become something that God could love. Anyways, Keith's ministry, when he wasn't speaking at youth conferences, was on the streets of Atlanta. He worked with homeless teens, people who most, for the most part, came from really broken homes, victims of abuse, victims of neglect. He, he was working with people who were confused about their sexuality. He was working with transgender people before our society had a category for them. You know, he, that, that's who he was with. And he said, you know, this ministry, it's messy. I, I, it breaks my heart. I, I, but I don't know what to do except to stumble around and just hold on to people the best I can, knowing that God's holding on to me and through me holding on to them. That's how he described what he did on a daily basis. But he would say, you know, I look around sometimes and I get frustrated with the church because I want to ask, where are all the other Christians? And here's the phrase he said that always stuck in my head. He said, you know, sometimes I think Christians are too concerned about living righteously, about having nice, clean, neat, tidy lives. They're so concerned about living righteously, they have forgotten to love righteously. We do it with the best of intentions, right? We want to honor God. 
So we want to stay away from any avarice, any, any vice, any, 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 anything that's going to stink of sin. But in the process of keeping that distance, we, we make church an unsafe place for anyone who feels broken, anyone who feels unclean. Philip Yancey, in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, he tells a story of a, of a woman that he met at a shelter. And she shared with him his story, or shared with him her story. And, and as she told her story, I mean, there were things in her story that were so heartbreaking, that, that beyond heartbreaking, he said things that just turned my stomach as I listened to the choices she had to make. And, and he said at some point, he asked, did, did you ever consider going to the church for help or support in any of this time? And the woman looked at him like, church? I mean, not that she hated church. It just never entered her mind that a place like this was for people like her. And if we're honest, we all got a little bit of the Pharisee in us, don't we? I mean, all of us, we want to look clean on the outside. Even when things are broken and messy inside. We come to church, and whenever we come to church, we put on our Sunday best. And when people ask us how we are, we say, I'm good, I'm fine, things are great, even if they're not. We may be dying inside, but we don't know how to say that to people. Because when we look around at everyone else, all their cups are clean too. No one looks like they're dying. So how do we get healed on the inside? I mean, how do we get clean on the inside? The answer is love. It is only love that penetrates the heart, only love that cleans us up inside. I mean, the irony is, is that it's, it's not when we're cleanest that we're closest to God. It, it's when we're most broken. It's when we're most messy. That's when we discover the heart of Jesus. That's when we realize that he died for our sins so that we could be wiped clean, the, forgiven, the slate could be cleared. That's why he went to the cross. It, it, it's only when we're most broken that we realize that Jesus is the good Samaritan. He's the one who was despised and rejected, but who paid the price for our healing. And when we experience that kind of love, in the midst of our brokenness and mess. That's what transforms our hearts, where we become a place where grace rules. And it changes the way we not only see ourselves, but the way we see others. Because we're no longer judging others by the perfection that we all project. Instead, we just see people in need of God's love, just like we, too, are in need of God's love. Have you ever experienced a good Samaritan? Has there ever been a person who in a moment of darkness was Christ's light to you? The message today is simple. Go and do likewise. Be Christ's hands, his feet, be his love and his grace, reaching out to tell the world, you're clean because Christ died for you. Amen. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, we confess that we are an unclean people. We have unclean lips. We have unclean hearts. And yet we know, God, that through your grace, you alone can make us clean. We pray, God, that we might be clean indeed, not just clean on the outside where people see, but inside our hearts, that our hearts might become a habitation fit for thee, that our hearts might be a place where you could take up residence. Help us, God, to understand how much you love us. Help us, God, to understand how much you love our neighbor. May love rule in our hearts. Amen.